Gorabaktavinda, Gorabaktavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Mahaprabhu ki jai, Shrimati Radharani ki jai, Guru Premanandi. So today is the most blessed day, Radhastami. We're celebrating the glories of Srimati Radharani, without whose favor one cannot approach Krishna. Krishna is called Madan Mohan, and Srimati Radharani is named Madan Mohan Mohini. Krishna attracts Cupid, but Radharani attracts Krishna. So she is the most special person in this material and spiritual world. There's no one equal to her or greater than her because she has complete love for Krishna. She's the greatest lover of Krishna. So today we're going to hear why Lord Chaitanya appeared, the confidential reasons, so that we can understand the emotions and love and transcendental qualities of Srimati Radharani because Lord Chaitanya is the combined incarnation of Radha and Krishna. So, f first of all, Krishna realized that Srimati Radharani has experienced some things that, and many things that he's not experiencing because he cannot really experience himself the way Radharani does. So, he wanted to take the position of Radharani to relish her uh, let's see, feelings of love for him. And secondly, uh, he wanted to be able to understand the transcendental mellows of love of himself. He cannot do it himself. He, ha he, he, has, he, he wanted to take the position of Radharani so that he could taste those mellows that she was experiencing in himself. And three, he wanted to enjoy the bliss tasted by Srimati Radharani. So, we see that the, ex the, the internal reasons why Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared was all about Srimati Radharani. There were external reasons also. He wanted to preach the significance, the special significance, significance of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama. All perfection can be achieved in spiritual life by chanting sincerely and purely the holy names of the Lord, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Because there's Radharani, Hare, or Hara, there's Krishna, the Supreme Person of Godhead, and he is the reservoir of all pleasure, Rama. And secondly, he wanted to answer the call of Advaita Charya, who was praying to him to appear and uh, s s straighten out this Kali Yuga, which was extremely inauspicious, especially 500 years ago. And therefore, Advaita Charya said, you please come. If you don't come, then I'll end up destroying all these people. They're so rascal. But by your mercy, you can save them. So, this first reason that Radharani is actually the abode of love, and Lord Chaitanya wanted to uh, experience that position of Srimati Radharani, relish it. And uh, there's beautiful explanations of this. It says, The love of Radhika is my teacher and I am her dancing pupil. Her prema makes me dance various novel dances. I, don't, I do not know the strength of Radha's love with which she always overwhelms me. And then there's a very nice poem. Oh, my beloved friend Rinda, where are you coming from? I am coming from the feet of Shihari. Where is he 
in the forest on the bank of Radhakunda. What is he doing there? He is learning dancing. Who is his master? Your image, Radha, revealing itself in every tree and creeper in every direction, is roaming like a skillful, dance, skillful dancer, making him dance behind. <coughs> so this is a text from the Govinda Lilam Rita of Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. Krishna continues, whatever pleasure I get from tasting my love for Srimati Radharani, she tastes 10 million times more than me by her love. Just as I am the abode of all mutually contradictory characteristics, so Radha's love is always full of similar contradictions. Radha's love is all-pervading, leaving no room for expansion, but still it is expanding constantly. There is certainly nothing greater than her love, but her love is devoid of pride. That is the sign of its greatness. Nothing is purer than her love, but its behavior is always perverse and crooked. All glory is to Radha's love for Krishna, the enemy of the demon Mura. Although it is all-pervading, it tends to increase at every moment. Although it is important, it is devoid of pride. And although it is pure, it is always beset with duplicity. Sri Radhika is the highest abode of that love, and I am its only object. I taste the bliss to which the object of love is entitled, but the pleasure of Radha, the abode of that love, is 10 million times greater. My mind races to taste the pleasure experienced by the abode, but I cannot taste it even by my best efforts, how may I taste it? If sometime I can be the abode of that love, only then may I taste its joy. And Prabhupada writes in purport to this verse, he says, Vishaya and Aishraya are two very significant words relating to the reciprocation between Krishna and his devotee. The devotee is called Ashraya. In other words, the devotee takes shelter of the Lord. And his beloved, Krishna, is the Vishaya, the one who gives this shelter. Different ingredients are involved in the exchange of love between the Ashraya and the Vishaya, which are known as Vibhava, Anubhava, Sattvika, Vyabhipana, Alambana. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Vyabhipana and Alambana may further may be further divided into Ashraya and Vishaya. In the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna, Radharani is the Ashraya feature and Krishna the Vishaya. The transcendental consciousness of the Lord tells him, I am Krishna and I experience pleasure as the Vishaya. The pleasure enjoyed by Radharani, the Ashraya, is many times greater than the pleasure I feel. Therefore, to feel the pleasure of the Ashraya category Lord Krishna appeared as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Thinking in this way, Lord Krishna was curious to taste that love. His eager desire for that love increasingly blazed in his heart. So that's the first confidential reason why the Lord appeared <clears throat> to relish the transcendental love that Srimati Radharani was experiencing. Now the second desire of the Lord to appear is, my sweetness is wonderful, infinite and full. No one in the three worlds can find its limit. Only Radhika, by the strength of her love, tastes all the nectar of my sweetness. Although Radha's love is pure like a mirror, its purity increases at every moment. My sweetness also has no room for expansion. Yet it shines before that mirror in newer and newer beauty. There is constant competition between my sweetness and the mirror of Radha's love. They both go on increasing, but neither knows defeat. My sweetness is always newer and newer. Devotees taste it according to their own receptive love. If I see my sweetness in a mirror, I am tempted to taste it, but nevertheless I cannot. If I deliberate 
on a way to taste it, I find that I hanker for the position of Radhika. And Prabhupada writes a purport, he says, Krishna's attractiveness is wonderful and unlimited. No one can know the end of it. Sri Mati Radharani alone can relish such extensiveness from her position in the Ashraya category. The mirror, Sri Mati Radharani's transcendental love, the mirror of Sri Mati Radharani's transcendental love is perfectly clear, yet it appears clearer and clearest in the transcendental method of understanding Krishna. In the mirror of Radha's, Radharani's heart, the transcendental features of Krishna appear increasingly new and fresh. In other words, the attraction of Krishna increases in proportion to the understanding of Srimati Radharani. Each tries to supersede the other. Neither wants to be defeated in increasing the intensity of love. Desiring to understand Radharani's attitude of increasing love, Lord Krishna appeared as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Who manifests an abundance of sweetness greater than mine, which has never been experienced before and which causes wonder to all? Alas, I myself, my mind bewildered upon seeing this beauty, impetuously desires to enjoy it like Srimati Radharani. This text is from the Lalita Madhava 8.34 of Srila Rupa Goswami. It was spoken by Lord Krishna when he saw the beauty of his own reflection in a jeweled fountain in Dwarka. The beauty of Krishna has one natural strength. It thrills the hearts of all men and women, beginning with Lord Krishna himself. All minds are attracted by hearing his sweet voice and flute, or by seeing his beauty. Even Lord Krishna himself makes efforts to taste that sweetness. The thirst of one who always drinks the nectar of that sweetness is never satisfied. Rather, that thirst increases constantly. Such a person, being unsatisfied, begins to blaspheme Lord Brahma, saying that he does not know the art of creating he does not know the art of creating well and is simply inexperienced. He has not given millions of eyes to see the beauty of Krishna. He has given only two eyes and even those two, those eyes blink. How then shall I see the lovely face of Krishna? The gopi said, O Krishna, when you go to the forest during the day and we do not see your sweet face, which is surrounded by beautiful curling hair, half a second becomes as long as an entire age for us. And we consider the creator who has put eyelids on the eyes we use for seeing you to be simply a fool. This is a verse spoken by the gopis in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.31.15. The gopis saw their beloved Krishna at Kurukshetra after a long separation. They secured and embraced him in their hearts, through their eyes, and they attained a joy so intense that not even perfect yogis can attain it. The gopis cursed the creator for creating eyelids that interfered with their vision. This text is from Srimad Bhagavatam 1082-39. So we, we get a glimpse from this text how the gopis relish Krishna with such intensity that it overwhelms them. And there's no comparison to this in the material world. The mundane, sensuous pleasures of materialists is nothing compared to the joy that the gopis experience that is so intense that not even perfect yogis can attain it. And they do this in their hearts and through their eyes. That is the key to understanding the loving relationships in the spiritual world. There is no consummation for the eyes rather than the sight of Krishna. Whoever sees him is most fortunate indeed. The gopis said, O oh friends, those eyes that see the beautiful faces of the sons of Maharaj Nanda are certainly fortunate. As these two sons enter the forest surrounded by their friends, driving the cows before them, they hold their flutes to their mouths and glance lovingly upon the resonance of Vrindavana. For those who have eyes, we think there's no greater object of vision. Purport. 
Like the gopis, one can see Krishna continuously if one is fortunate enough. In the Brahma Sanita, it is said that sages whose eyes have been smeared with the ointment of pure love can see the form of Shamsundara, Krishna, continuously in the centers of their hearts. The, next, the text from Srimad, this text from Srimad Bhagavatam 10.21.7 was sung by the gopis on the advent of the Sarat season. So again we see there's a major difference between the transcendental nectarian pleasures of the gopis in the spiritual world experienced primarily through their eyes, by their eyes, through the heart, uh, rather than the sensuous pleasures experienced through the gross body of the living entities in the material world. The women of Mathura said, what austerities must the gopis have performed? With their eyes, they always drink the nectar of the form of Lord Krishna, which is the essence of loveliness and is not to be equaled or surpassed. In that loveliness is the only abode of beauty, fame, and opulence. It is self-perfect, self-ever-fresh, and extremely rare. Purport, this text from Srimad Bhagavatam 1044-14 was spoken by the women of Mathura when they saw Krishna and Balaram in the arena with King Kamsa's great wrestlers, Mustika and Chanura. So again, the women of Mathura are uh, experiencing and glorifying the gopis. And it says, with their eyes they always drink the nectar of the form of Lord Krishna. The sweetness of Lord Krishna is unprecedented and its strength is also unprecedented. Simply by one's hearing of such beauty, the mind becomes unsteady. Lord Krishna's own beauty attracts Lord Krishna himself. But because he cannot fully enjoy it, his mind remains full of sorrow. This is a description of his second desire. Now please listen as I describe the third. This conclusion of Rasa is extremely deep. Only Swaru Damodara knows much about it. Anyone else who claims to know it must have heard it from him, for he is the most intimate companion of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The love of the gopis is called Radha Bhava. It is pure and spotless. It is not at any time lust. As already explained, purport, as already explained, the position of gopis in their loving dealings with Krishna is transcendental. Their emotion is called Radha Bhava. Although it is apparently like mundane sex, one should not confuse it with mundane sexual love, for it is pure and unadulterated love of God, Godhead. Rod, oh, I'm sorry, Ruda Baba, I'm sorry, not Radha Baba, Ruda Baba, you're right. The pure love of the gopis has become celebrated by the name lust. The dear devotees of the Lord, headed by Sri Uddhava, desire to taste that love. Purport, this is a verse from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, 1 to 285. Lust and love have different characteristics, just as iron and gold have different natures. The desire is greatly one's own, the desire to gratify one's own senses is kama, lust. But the desire to please the senses of Lord Krishna is prema, love. Purport. The revealed scriptures describe pure love as follows. If there is ample reason for the dissolution of a conjugal relationship, and yet such a dissolution does not take place, such a relationship of intimate love is called pure. The predominated gopis were bound to Krishna in such pure love. For them, there was no question of sexual love based on sense gratification. Their only engagement in life was to see Krishna happy in all respects, regardless of their own personal interests. They dedicated their soul solely for the satisfaction of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. There was not the slightest tinge of sexual love between the gopis and Krishna. 
The author of Shi Chaitanya Charitamrita asserts that authority, with authority that sexual love is a matter of personal sense enjoyment. All the regulative principles in the Vedas pertaining to desires for popularity, fatherhood, wealth, and so on, are different phases of sense gratification. Acts of sense gratification may be performed under the cover of public welfare, nationalism, religion, altruism, ethical codes, biblical codes, health directives, fruit of action, blasphemous, bashfulness, tolerance, personal comfort, liberation from material bondage, progress, family affection, or fear of social ostracism or legal punishment. But all these categories are different subdivisions of one substance, sense gratification. All such good acts are performed basically for one's own sense gratification. For no one can sacrifice his personal interest while discharging these much advertised moral and religious principles. But above all, this is a transcendental stage in which one feels himself to be only an eternal servitor of Krishna, the absolute personality of Godhead. All acts performed in this sense of servitude are called pure love of God because they are performed for the absolute sense gratification of Sri Krishna. However, any act performed for the purpose of enjoying its fruits or results is an act of sense gratification. Such actions are visible sometimes in gross and sometimes in subtle forms. This is why the intimate pastimes of Radha and Krishna should not be explained to people who have not been completely purified by devotional service. Because when they hear these things, they equate it with mundane sexual love in the material world, where it has nothing to do with that at all. And therefore, uh, this is a confidential subject. It's only meant for devotees, and devotees who have surpassed the level of desiring something for themselves. They only desire, such devotees only desire to please Guru and Krishna. And they're free of all speculation and all uh, whimsical behavior their only thought is how to please the Lord by following the, strictly the instructions of Guru. The objects of lust, the object of lust is only the enjoyment of one's own senses. But love caters to the enjoyment of Lord Krishna and thus it is very powerful. Social customs, scriptural injunctions, bodily demands, fruit of action, shyness, patience, bodily pleasures, self-gratification, and the path of Varnashram Dharma, which is difficult to give up. The gopis have forsaken all these, as well as their own relatives and their punishment and scolding for the sake of serving Lord Krishna. They render loving service to him for the sake of his enjoyment. This is called firm attachment to Lord Krishna. It is spotlessly pure, like a clean cloth that has no stain. Purport. The author of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita advises everyone to give up all engagements of sense gratification and, like the gopis, dovetail oneself entirely with the will of the Supreme Lord. That is the ultimate instruction of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. We should be prepared to do anything and everything to please the Lord, even at the risk of violating the Vedic principles or ethical laws. That is the standard of love of Godhead. Such activities in pure love of Godhead are as spotless as white linen that has been completely washed. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakura warns us in this connection that we should not mistakenly think that the idea of giving up everything implies the renunciation of duties necessary in relation to the body and mind. Even such duties are not sense gratification if they are undertaken in a spirit of service to Krishna. That's an extremely important point that requires a lot of thought and explanation. That'll be a subject of something we'll talk about later. Therefore, lust and love are quite different. Lust is like dense darkness, but love is like the bright sun. Thus, there is not the slightest taint of lust in the gopi's love. 
Their relationship with Krishna is only for the sake of his enjoyment. O oh, dearly beloved, your lotus feet are so soft that we place them gently on our breasts, fearing that your feet will be hurt. Our life rests only in you. Our minds, therefore, are filled with anxiety that your tender feet might be wounded by pebbles as you roam about on the forest path. Purport. This text from Srimad Bhagavatam 10.31.19 was spoken by the gopis when Krishna left them in the midst of the rasa dance, rasa lila. The gopis do not care for their own pleasures or pain, pains. All their physical and mental activities are directed toward offering enjoyment to Lord Krishna. They renounced everything for Krishna. They have pure attachments to giving Krishna pleasure. O oh, my beloved gopis, you have renounced social customs, scriptural injunctions, and your relatives for my sake. I disappeared behind you only to increase your concentration upon me. Since I disappeared for your benefit, you should not be displeased with me. Lord Krishna has a promise from before to reciprocate with his devotees according to the way they worship him. In whatever way my devotees surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to say here. That is, last night I was watching all the ladies uh, making different types of garlands and floral uh, decorations for the uh, Radharani for today. And also... Uh, the Pujaris were gleefully uh, accepting those beautiful uh, bouquets and garlands to decorate the, the, the uh, altar and decorate uh, the deities. And that is the spiritual world. That's a glimpse, a slight glimpse of what is the spiritual world. The cooperation, the joy, and the pleasure of rendering service with no personal interest, even if one has to stay up late and still get up early the next morning, that uh, cooperative effort of all the devotees uh, last night and today is what is what we understand as uh, the spiritual world in which everyone cooperates to please Krishna. There's no envy, there's no jealousy, uh, there's no, uh, let's say, uh, attempts to subvert all those efforts. Everyone is supporting each other to serve Radha and Krishna uh, in pure love and devotion. That is what is experienced every day in the spiritual world and in the material world, unfortunately, there is conflict, there are all kinds of different desires for sense gratification, and that unity and diversity is broken. But in Krishna consciousness, this is what Prabhupada wants us to uh, do, this unity and diversity where we all work together even though we're different people, but we have one desire, that is to please Guru and Krishna. The promise has been broken by the worship of the gopis, as Lord Krishna himself admits. O oh, gopis, I am not able to repay my debt for your spotless service, even within a lifetime of Brahma. Your connection with me is beyond reproach. You have worshipped me, cutting off all domestic ties, which are difficult to break. Therefore, please let, let your own glorious deeds be your compensation. So Krishna is admitting that he is violating his promise, that he will reciprocate with the devotees according to their surrender to him. But the gopis are so surrendered to him that he cannot reciprocate. What? You didn't, you didn't read the book. I'm going to read it. Verse. Oh, which one is that? Yeah, I wanted to make that other point. Krishna was never ungrateful to the gopis, for as he declares to Arjuna in this verse from the Bhagavad Gita 4.11, he reciprocates with his devotees in proportion to the transcendental loving service they render unto him. Everyone follows the path that leads toward him. 
but there are different degrees of progress on that path. And the Lord is realized in proportion to one's advancement. The path is one, but the progress in approaching the ultimate goal is different, and therefore the proportion of realization of this goal, namely the absolute personality God, it is also different. The gopis attain the highest goal, and Lord Chaitanya affirmed that there is no method of worshiping God higher than that followed by the gopis. So that's why Krishna says that he broke his promise. He's not able to reciprocate. Therefore, he says that the gopis should be satisfied simply by their service. Purport, this verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10.32.22, was spoken by Sri Krishna himself when he returned to the gopis upon hearing their songs of separation. Next verse. Now, whatever affection we see the gopis show for their own bodies, know it for certain to be only for the sake of Lord Krishna. The selfless purport, the selfless love of Godhead exhibited by the gopis cannot have any parallel. We should not therefore misunderstand the carefulness of the gopis in their personal decoration. The gopis dressed themselves as beautifully as possible just to make Krishna happy by seeing them. They had no ulterior desires. They, dedica they dedicated their bodies and everything they possessed to the service of Sri Krishna, taking it for granted that their bodies were meant for his enjoyment. They dressed themselves with the understanding that Krishna would be happy by seeing and touching them. So this is a very difficult point for people to understand because we see that women in this world decorate their bodies with clothes and jewelry and uh, perfume, and high heels and all different things. And, but their purpose is to not please someone else, but to attract attention to themselves for their own selfish pleasure. It's a major difference between the gopis dressing themselves meticulously to please the Lord and modern uh, and women today, not only in modern times, even in ancient times, decorating themselves. Now, whatever affection we see the gopis show for their own bodies, know it for certain to be only for the sake of Lord Krishna. And then the gopis think, I have offered this body to Lord Krishna. He is its owner, and it brings him enjoyment. Krishna finds joy in seeing and touching this body. It is for this reason that they cleanse and decorate their bodies. O oh, Arjuna, there are no greater receptacles of deep love for me than the gopis, who cleanse and decorate their bodies because they consider them mine. In purport. This verse is spoken by Lord Krishna in the Adi Purana. <clears throat> Next verse. There is another wonderful feature of the emotion of the gopis. Its power is beyond the comprehension of the intelligence. When the gopis see Lord Krishna, they derive unbounded bliss, although they have no desire for such pleasure. The gopis take a pleasure 10 million times greater than the pleasure Lord Krishna derives from seeing them. Purport. The wonderful characteristics of the gopis are beyond imagination. They have no desire for personal satisfaction. Yet when Krishna is happy by seeing them, the happiness of Krishna makes the gopis a million times more happy than Krishna himself. The gopis have no indication for their own enjoyment, and yet their joy increases. That is indeed a contradiction. For this contradiction, I see only one solution. The joy of the gopis lies in the joy of their beloved Krishna. Purport. The situation of the gopis is perplexing, for although they did not want personal happiness, it was imposed upon them. The solution to this perplexity is that Sri Krishna's sense of happiness is limited by the happiness of the gopis. Devotees at Vrindavan therefore tried to serve the gopis, namely Radharani and her associates. If one gains the favor of the gopis, he is easily gains the favor of Krishna because on the recommendation of the gopis, Krishna at once accepts the service of a devotee. Lord Chaitanya, therefore, wanted to please the gopis instead of Krishna. But his contemporaries misunderstood him, and for this reason, Lord Chaitanya renounced the order of householder life and became a sannyasi. 
When Lord Krishna sees the gopis, his joy increases and his unparalleled sweetness increases also. The gopis think, Krishna has obtained so much pleasure by seeing me. That thought increases the fullness and beauty of their faces and bodies. The beauty of Lord Krishna increases at the sight of the beauty of the gopis. And the more the gopis see Lord Krishna's beauty, the more their beauty increases. In this way, a competition takes place between them in which no one acknowledges defeat. Krishna, however, derives pleasure from the beauty and good qualities of the gopis. And when the gopis see his pleasure, the joy of the gopis increases. Therefore, we find that the joy of the gopis nourishes the joy of Lord Krishna. For that reason, the fault of lust is not present in their love. Purport by Srila Prabhupada, this is a ex very important point. By looking at the beautiful gopis, Krishna becomes enlivened, and this enlivens the gopis, whose youthful faces and bodies blossom. This competition of increasing beauty between the gopis and Krishna, which is without limitations, is so delicate that sometimes mundane moralists mistake these dealings to be purely amorous. But these affairs are not at all mundane because the gopis' intense desire to satisfy Krishna surcharges the entire scene with pure love of Godhead, with not a spot of sexual indulgence. I worship Lord Krishna coming back from the forest of Raja. He is worshipped by the gopis. I'm sorry. I worship Lord Keshava. Coming back from the forest of Raja, he is worshipped by the gopis who mount the roofs of their palaces and meet him on the path with a hundred manners of dancing, glances, and gentle smiles. The corners of his eyes wander like large black bees around the gopis' breasts. This statement appears in the Keshavastaka 8 of the Stava Mala compiled by Sri Rupa Goswami. So again, we see that this exchange of love, the most intense exchanges of love happen by a hundred manners of dancing, glances, and gentle smiles. And Krishna's, uh, the corners of his eyes wander like large black bees around the gopis' breasts. There is another natural symptom of the gopis' love that shows it to be without a trace of lust. The love of the gopis nourishes the sweetness of Lord Krishna. That sweetness in turn increases their love, for they are greatly satisfied. The happiness of the abode of love is in the happiness of the object of that love. This is not a relationship of desire for personal gratification. So that is what we should meditate on today. The happiness of the abode of love, meaning Radharani, is in the happiness of the object of that love. This is not a relationship of desire for personal gratification. So Radharani and the gopis have no desire for their personal gratification. Every woman in the material world and every man in the material world is desiring their own sense gratification through all their relationships. That is not present at all in the spiritual world, and especially exemplified by the gopis. So we'll stop right there. Are there any questions? There's a lot more to say, but uh, this is what we should meditate on today. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.